Okay, our next speaker is Heather Knight, founder of the rather lovely named Marilyn Monroe Bot. Uh, Heather is a PhD student at Carnegie Mellon University, which is about the best place you can be studying robotics, I think, in the world. And her works have been featured at TED and SIGGRAPH. Please welcome Heather Knight. Hey guys, um, pleasure to be here. I uh, always have fun at Humanity Plus conferences thinking about technology and the future. And I think it's a great topic today. And as we design our future, um, and as we create new technologies, and as we bicker about what we want and innovate together, um, it came to me, I was wondering, are we the modern Greek gods? Um, so I'm a roboticist by training. I studied electrical engineering. Um, I have this robot theater company, Marilyn Monroe Robot, where I'm trying to intersect entertainment and technology to innovate um, and create more charismatic robots. Um, and I'll tell you a little bit about that at Robot Film Festival. So we've been talking about a lot of exciting things, and this whole weekend will frame these, some of these ideas. The ones that I tend to think about is how do we create intelligent machines? How do we build relatable robotic characters? Um, I'm interested in creating everyday robots that can be our companions, companions and helpers. In our last talk and in future talks, we're going to be hearing about the idea of using biology as a palette for creation and the idea of augmenting and improving ourselves. So does this make us some sort of new kind of Prometheus? And so I, I was looking at, in preparation for the talk, what, what is the myth of Prometheus? Now, so Prometheus uh, brought fire to mankind. He, became our, he was our champion. Uh, he helped create man out of clay. Uh, Athena breathed life into his form. And uh, the root of actual the, of the fire in the mythology, if you look at the ancient text, is techne. So he brought not just fire, but this idea of knowledge and technology to humanity. And he is kind of a, a father figure to mankind. Uh, a lot of the other gods did not, uh, were not such big fans. Uh, he got in a lot of trouble with Zeus um, for bringing, technolo bringing technology uh, to humanity, to his creation, um, and uh, he played lots of tricks on Zeus. There was uh, going back and forth in order to enable that to happen, and Zeus got very mad at him um, and ended up uh, bound bounding him to the top of the a Caucasus mountain with an unbreakable adamantite chain, and every day this uh, eagle vulture bird would come and eat out his liver, um, which would then regenerate into the next the next day, and it would happen again. And um, Zeus ultimately gave him two ways out of that, and so Hercules, with the help of uh, another centaur that uh, sacrificed himself, uh, managed to eventually. Humankind did eventually. Uh, rescue their, their champion. Um, but I think it brings up some really interesting themes about this relationship between the creator and the created. Um, he took a very uh, nurturing role. I mean, he sacrificed himself for his children. And, and uh, if you look, as we look at other uh, mythology about creating new technologies, uh, that's an interesting role for him to take. I also think it raises uh, some of these questions about how do we deal with conflict in, within ourselves as the modern Greek gods and creators. Right. So, um, yeah. So I'm, a, I'm an engineer. So this is kind of a weird space for me. Um, but I, I think that there's a really interesting role for narrative to help analyze the ethics of our impact and effect. And it, even in the last presentation, we saw so many instances where there had been a movie or a story that had been written that examined um, what we actually wanted from these new types of technologies going into the future and allowed us to analyze those consequences before they're technologically feasible or possible. And that really, in, as in the last point shows, it can impact and shape the design and creation of new technologies. And I'm also interested in how you can use technology to enable this process of exploring impact, expression, and, and what are we actually, what is this larger search for meaning? So in this, uh, you know, a, a web to HTML5 or, or this new web that was in the first talk, like it created this, this, this new dialogue for exploring what we wanted out of life. And so how can we leverage technology to create new mythologies and, and new explorations of meaning? And then also how can we use narrative to shape uh, and frame and analyze and critique uh, this process of creation. 
So to do some of this in the specific frame of robotics, I founded a robot film festival, um, which will be uh, happening uh, in a couple months uh, in this summer at the Three-Legged Dog Art and Technology Center, July 16 and 17. Uh, we are seeking submissions of short films, eight minutes and other, that can analyze the impact of robotics, as uh, whether real or fictional, uh, display current research. And so that'll be fun. We will have a red carpet award ceremony. We're absolutely ripping off the Oscars. Um, the, <laughs> the, the awards will be 3D printed by robots, and the base will be robotically milled, and that video will be available. So, um, right. So, this is a really um, beautiful piece uh, about uh, from a dance troupe called Kid Pivot, um, choreographed by the Canadian choreographer Crystal Peak. Um, and uh, you, c you can see a lot of metaphors to this creation. So at first everything is going really well, then there's kind of a lot of trouble that's happening with this creation, and it's like, and so it's like the, the point is, are you, what direction are you going to go? Is it, what is our relationship with our creations? And Prometheus, in the end, he was saved um, by his creations. In this one, there's kind of this deconstruction of what is what is real. And so in the end, they kind of deconstruct the first thing that had happened and manage to breathe life back into their uh, more positive relationship with technology. Um, anyway, uh, I, so I think one thing that uh, a lot of artistic practices and design practices have that uh, traditional engineering sometimes lacks is this uh, engagement with critique and of uh, your larger impact as like as in the critical analysis of your work. Uh, we're really good at analyzing whether something is technologically feasible or will meet its specifications. Um, but something that uh, that I that I really like about the artistic processes and narratives is that they provide a framework for critiquing your work and where you're going with it. Um, so this obviously evokes uh, a story that we all no, um, which is Frankenstein. And this is actually a picture uh, from the 1931 Bride of Frankenstein. Uh, but uh, one thing I didn't know that I learned in researching this talk is that uh, Mary Shelley's, her subtitle for the original book was actually a modern Prometheus, which I thought was pretty interesting. Um, one thing that's uh, different about the Frankenstein myth than the Pr Prometheus myth is it's, it's not the gods creating humans, it's humans creating something else. So these start, this starts to evoke these ideas of this hierarchies of creations and creators. Um, what are, how, do the, how do the rules change when it's not that God's creating something? So we also, um, in, in the, Mary Shelley's also much more influenced by uh, like this monotheistic religion where the gods are, or God is infallible. Um, so that it has a diff very different perspective. So this idea of humanity usurping the role of the perfect God is a little bit different than humanity usurping the role of these kind of imperfect <laughs> Greek gods. Um, so maybe uh, there's some reasons why it comes to a different conclusion. There are these themes that uh, if, uh, if you, the humans usurp the role of God, that things will always go terribly wrong, or they will, they, we will feel the wrath of God because we're doing something that we're not supposed to. 
Um, there's also a very different relationship between the creator and Frankenstein. He rejects Frankenstein and throws him out into the world. And Frankenstein, I mean, it, he's rejected by his parents and he kind of goes crazy and there's, there's a lot of negativity there, but is that really because that's something that's fundamentally true of technology or is it because of the way that that parent figure treated his technology? So, uh, interesting analysis, right? There's, that, I think something that's kind of fun about um, using narrative and using storytelling is that uh, robotics has had a long history with performance. Even the, even the word robot came from this play by Carl uh, Kepek, um, R-U-R, -U -R, Rossum's Universal Robots. It was debuted in 1921. It actually comes from the Czech word for work worker. And something that's interesting about that is these automated workers were um, created from biological materials. It wasn't mechanical. Um, and so they, many of their parts were grown as sort of that of blood and liver. And that's, a, again, a throwback to the Prometheus, the regeneration of the liver, this idea that you can use these processes um, that can yeah, use human form, um, like human materials. I, I don't really like biology. Gooey. That's why I make robots. Um, but anyway, uh, <laughs> I'm kind of like I'm kind of glad I'm a roboticist like right now because I'm sure all of you guys are going to make this really gooey really soon. But um, <laughs> I really like the mechanical construction. Right. And so, we, and so robotics has had a long history with entertainment. Something that I think is really interesting and different is we've been talking mostly about Western culture, um, and and but uh, Eastern culture has a really different. Uh, dialogue and relationship with machines. They, they tend to think technology is going to be our friend. That's their default. The Terminator situation is not inherent to their culture. Um, Astro Boy again has a similar story. He was created by the Minister of Science. This is one of the most popular comics and television shows to ever um, ha occur in Japan. So this is what people grew up with. Uh, the original comic strip was debuted in 1952. There was a television series in the 60s, again in the 80s. Uh, more recent make in, in yeah, English world uh, just came out. I, I like the originals. Um, I very much recommend <laughs> taking out some of the 80s series and looking at that. But so something that was interesting, so the Minister of Science had lost his son in an accident, and so he created Astro Boy to look exactly like his son, and at first he really loved his creation, um, but then he started seeing these dyssynchronies, but like he, he couldn't really replace the thing that he lost um, like Astro Boy would find these squares on the wall so much more aesthetically fascinating than, than a flower. So there, <laughs> he still could experience human emotions, but they were, there was something different. So his, his father rejected him. And um, he didn't go crazy, but he did join the circus. <laughs> <laughs> so they were using him with his superpowers to lift around elephants. And eventually, many years later, uh, the Ministry of Science is, uh, is replaced by another guy who rediscovers Astro Boy and adopts him as his real son. And that's when Astro become, Boy becomes the superhero that we know and love, um, who's done, who, who uh, engages with people that hate technology, um, helps make things go into the, uh, happily into the future, kind of teaches us um, how to be more human by his sort of superhero uh, star. Um, oh, he reminds me a lot of like kind of like bright-eyed, perfect superhero, not so much like Batman, more like Superman. But there's actually even one episode where he uh, travels back in time, because he lives in the future, um, to the Vietnam War and, and prevents the Americans from bombing and assaults the villagers. So interesting dialogue. And so one of the, wh why would they think that um, a robot would be an inherently positive uh, thing? Perhaps it's explained by religion. Uh, so in the Shinto faith, uh, which was uh, pervasive over much of Asia, and particularly in Japan before um, Buddhism, there was this idea that the spirit was inherent in objects. Now originally that was true uh, for the gods. The gods invested their spirits um, in uh, like the, the mountains and the trees, uh, but later expanded to uh, our everyday, everything objects. And there was a belief that th these spirits would naturally want to be in harmony with humans. So this is a really different uh, take. Right. Um, so um, th this is an example from a Shinto shrine um, of a very living, feeling, friendly object. I, I, uh, so I. I um, I used to work for this French robotics company, Aldebaran, and my, my former boss was talking about demoing this robot in Japan. And he, he wanted to show that it was resilient, so he'd like knock it over when it was walking, and then it would, would not break. And they're like, please, please don't do that again. Yeah. Don't hurt the robot. <laughs> so, big difference. Um, <laughs> 
Culture can really influence uh, media representations of robotics and these application designs. And uh, there, I, I was talking to this reporter um, last fall, and where, who did some a deeper analysis of some of these ideas than I did. And so, it, so if, you're, if Japan is predisposed to look as robots as help helpmates, and we are uh, tend to the more Western view, uh, monotheistic view of viewing robots as dangerous, it should hardly surprise us that one nation favors their use in war, while the other imagines them as benevolent companions suitable for assisting in rapidly aging and increasing independent population. So interesting idea, right? Um, and, and it's one that I take heart in, because perhaps that means that if we can change media representations of technology, we will create different kinds of technology. So um, I feel like the modern Prometheus sometimes. Um, and that, uh, I, I mean, robots have a long way to go before they can fully realize uh, character and expression, um, but that's something that, that drives me. And I'm going to show you a sample of a uh, video recently made with an acting professor on Carnegie Mellon, which is, uh, do I have sound? Uh, hit the audio on the laptop. Oh, you're going out. is very important because... In order to generate the flow of blood to the muscles and speed the next response time. Good point. But warm-up can also be to drill routine gestures that every actor uses in every performance they give. So we're going to start with a roll to the spine. I'll count us down when I count five. Okay? One, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five. Arms going out to the side next. And one, two, and shake. Again, arms up to the front, stretch the fingers, and back to neutral. Good. So, the next exercise is from the 20th century acting master, Michael Chekhov. Now, Michael Chekhov believed by using gesture or the physicality of the character, you could access the emotionality of their interior life. Okay, I'm going to start with the check off the motion suggestion. Let's start with the easiest emotion to access, which is anger. So I'm going to give you a verb, and I want you to physicalize that verb to access the emotion. The first verb is to smash. Maybe I care more about the audience. How does the robot make transparent what its motivations are? How does it actually communicate with us on human social terms? Because that's how we communicate. And uh, yeah, so as I was preparing for this talk, I was talking to Matt. Um, this, he's a acting professor at Carnegie Mellon about mythology and robots. And he uh, wrote me this interesting email yesterday uh, about one of the ideas that he thought was so interesting in ancient Greek mythology is that all the inhabitants of mythology were both metaphors of ideas 
as well as being considered true history by the Greeks. So Medusa was both a metaphor for immobilizing fear and was also believed to have existed long before humans. And there's an interesting potential parallel here when we look at robots, because they are both metaphors for processes we collectively share as a species when I try to imbue them with social behaviors. But they're also beings we can touch. So by being both, we are confronted with both our present self as well as our past and our future. So uh, I'll leave you uh, with that, that, these three ideas. Uh, I believe that we can leverage narratives to explore impact and ethics. I believe that we can use technology to catalyze new forms of expression and engagement with art and ourselves. And I believe that mythologies have the power to inspire and shape the creation and design of technology. So maybe I'll see you in July if you are, uh, have a robot in your pocket or um, would like to tell other people about the film festival or attend yourself. Uh, we're seeking submissions by June 5th. So thank you very much.